So here we are with Zoltan Dines, the author of this book, Understanding Psychology as a Science. So it's really nice that you want to be here. Nice to be here. Take some time for uh, this conference that we're at. Take some time for this interview. So first of all, I was wondering, how did you get into this topic? What decided that you would write about things like this or find them interesting? My interest goes back quite a way, actually. Uh, my mother was a Scientologist, and uh, the headmaster at the sixth form I was in gave me a book on Popper. Mm -hmm. So I read about Karl Popper, and he discusses what makes something a science and not a science, and that had a pretty big impact on me and how I viewed uh, various movements that might call themselves a science or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that, uh, also it's not just a label, but uh, Popper wanted to point out that uh, how you how you approach that really matters to the quality of the knowledge that you get. Okay, I see that you have some interest. One of the examples comes from um, precognition research and psi research, mm -hmm. and you did some studies about your, yourself, right? Yes. Now there, there's a and, and there's a topic where um, the sort of philosophy of science, philosophy of statistics, really comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. if you you uh, investigate a topic where a lot of people think the hypothesis, the theory, has a very low prior probability, mm -hmm. then just using p-values, so p less than 0 0.05, somehow doesn't seem right. And then to make a binary decision at the end of that doesn't seem right. Uh, whereas saying there's a certain amount of evidence here, and that will change your opinion by a certain amount, um, that just seemed a better way of dealing with, with, with theories where people might have radically different views yeah. about them in the first place. So that, that was in fact my first application of um, Bayesian statistics. All right, when you were doing that research, that's when you ventured into this direction of Bayesian statistics. Yeah, initially, um, 1980s, I was doing my PhD um, at Oxford, and Oxford invited this statistician from UCL, John Keir, who had been um, Piaget's statistician and Hans Ising's statistician. And he came to teach the PhD students at Oxford every Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon statistics. Um, was, I found him quite captivating, charismatic, uh, but he would teach just whatever he wanted to teach. And one term he said, I'm going to teach you Bayes. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the end of the term, there's just me and one other person sitting there. <laughs> and I found it absolutely fascinating. But the other people just thought, oh, this is not relevant to my thesis, all disappeared. All right. So uh, my, my stat, my little Bayesian um, base factor calculator, I actually programmed up uh, at that point, okay. uh, way back then. In, Late right. 1980s. So, so that's actually an interesting point, right? So you say that most of these students slowly left. But now, yeah. of course, if you write this, this book, there's a lot of topics in here that have to do with Bayesian statistics mm. and likelihood. So, so apparently you thought it was worthwhile that these students shouldn't leave. Actually, you thought it was worthwhile to explain more students about this. So, so why yes. do you think it's important that students learn about these topics? Uh, it, it's important because uh, there's a debate about uh, how one should do statistics that uh, isn't settled, or it seemed to be settled, but it wasn't. And the way we had settled on doing things um, caused problems. That's why we had the credibility crisis. That was, that was a big part of it. And now people are really thinking about how should we do statistics, how should we do, how should we do science. Mm -hmm. And I think in 10 years' time, uh, results sections are going to look rather different than they do now. And you can either be ahead of the curve on that, or you can be desperately trying to catch up later. Mm -hmm. And the people we need to reach are the current students coming up. They need to understand these issues and uh, where researchers have gone wrong in the past that led to science that wasn't really that credible mm -hmm. in the end. And if you don't understand statistics yeah. and the philosophy of science more generally, um, then you'll make, you'll make the same mistakes again. So yeah. I think, you know, th this is the time to change, change is happening mm -hmm. in ten years, ten years' time, science will look very different. I actually think in hundred years' time, people will look back on how we do science now, and it'll be a bit, look at, bit, bit like how we look back a hundred years ago, and you say, really, they did like that, that's pretty yeah. primitive. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the changes that will be coming about and uh, affecting how we do science in the future, they're happening right now. All right. So it's quite exciting in a way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay. Very good. So when you were examining all these things for yourself, these statistical techniques and mm -hmm. figuring out, uh, ma ma mainly this was because you needed to analyze your own data, right? I mean, you're not 
in principle, a statistician yourself. Right? No, trained as a psychologist. Yeah. Uh, huh. Exactly. So you're trying to figure out how to use this. So what things were most helpful to you or most uh, insightful or eye-opening when you were le learning about these things? I think when, when I wrote the book, and I don't know if it comes across there, but probably I was leaning towards a likelihood uh, approach. That sort of the it comes across a little bit. I yeah. noticed a little bit. Yes, uh, and well, e either that or Bayes. For me, a big issue was how you deal with non-significant results, because in my mm -hmm. field, non-significant results were often used to draw inferences. My field being unconscious knowledge, say unconscious perception, implicit learning, and how you establish that. Perception is unconscious, subliminal, or, or uh, learning is implicit, is often by getting a non-significant result. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but just getting a non-significant result in itself doesn't have evidential value. So what do you do? Well, so I was looking at likelihood inference and Bayes. And then just through having to really apply them in real situations, not write papers about statistics, but do psychology and apply the, those, those techniques, I found Bayes was just the most use useful because mm. typically when you have a theory you're saying well there's a range of possibilities for what the uh, population uh, hypothesis could be, some are more plausible than others uh, and that, as soon as you accept that uh, and want to get evidence from another hypothesis you're led to, you know, to Bayes factors and I've just found that enormously helpful. And if you look at how I write papers now even compared to three years ago mm. it, it's just radically different. Um, and I look back to how I wrote papers, really just bearing in mind, just following through the logic that's contained in that book, but just following it through and actually applying it. Mm. Uh, every, every, every step of the way has turned around how I do science. So you, you'd say you're still learning about these topics yourself? Still learning, exactly. So since 2008, when the book was published, I've been thinking about how do I actually apply it in real situations. Yeah. So exactly the same logic that's, that's in there, but mm -hmm. putting it into practice is what yeah. I've been working on. All right. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much.